Well, good morning, everyone. I'm going to see if I can turn this up. Yesterday, I had trouble with my audio. I apologize for that. I hope that uh, the audio is better today. But anyway, it's good to see you all. I hope that you're doing well. We do these devotionals, or at least we try to, Monday through Thursday. And we just spend some time encouraging each other and uh, spend some time uh, talking through some scripture. We've been thinking about the kingdom of God and what that term means, what uh, the prophets had promised was going to come about when the Messiah came. You see, you know, I've been thinking a lot about that. What did the prophets say would happen when the Messiah came? What did the Messiah's coming mean for Israel and for the world? That's what kingdom is all about. And what the prophets promised was that when the Messiah comes, there would be an age of eternal peace, perfect peace, because every one of God's enemies has been destroyed. And when we think about what it meant when Jesus came, and we think, well, why why did that not happen? Why did uh, this age of eternal peace not begin? Why were God's enemies not destroyed? Well, th- it did begin. God did keep his promises. And, and that's exactly what Jesus' parables explain, that the, the kingdoms of the enemies of God, the kingdoms of men, the kingdoms of the world, those who are opposed to God and contend against God and rebel against God, they would continue because God wanted to rescue people from those kingdoms. He wanted to rescue you and me. And so part of the way God is destroying his enemies is by converting his enemies into friends, by atoning for their sins and bringing them into his kingdom. And that age of eternal peace has already begun. Even though the kingdoms of the world continue, the age of eternal peace began with Jesus in his ministry and his self-giving love and his sacrifice on our behalf. That age of eternal peace has already begun and it has begun in us and with us. And we are the people not only who have been rescued out of the kingdoms of the world, but we have been brought into a kingdom of eternal peace because now we are no longer in rebellion to God and now we are at peace with our neighbors, with our friends, and even with our enemies in that we have decided to take up the way of Jesus and to love our neighbor as ourself, to adopt his way of living, of turning the other cheek and going the extra mile and praying for and blessing and feeding and giving drink to those who persecute us. This is what it looks like to be part of the kingdom, the part, the, be part of the kingdom of eternal peace, not waiting until all of the enemies are destroyed before we start to say, I want to be part of the kingdom, to be part of the kingdom now. So those are some of the things we've been exploring as we've talked through some of Jesus' parables. And of course, we're going to look at another one this morning in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 47. Jesus says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat, and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. Now, of course, that would be a a picture that would be familiar to a lot of people at that time. The fishermen would go out into a boat and would throw a huge dragnet out and they would drag the net and it would collect all kinds of fish, some that would be good to eat, some that would just be garbage, some that would be good things and some that would be bad things and they would drag it all in and then they would sit down and they would sort out the good from the bad and the good they put into containers and they threw away the bad. But then Jesus explains the parable and he says, so it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So again, as we've been saying, Jesus is reiterating the same sorts of points. His point is that it's not going to be an immediate thing. 
when the kingdoms of the world and the evil and those that contend and rebel against God, they're, they're not going to immediately come to an end. There's going to be this period of time of gathering up, of gathering up, of gathering up, of gathering up. And then finally, at the end of the age, then there will be a sorting. You remember, this is so much like Jesus' parable of the wheat and the tares, the weeds, and the evil one came and planted the, the weeds in amongst the wheat and it grew together. And the servant said, do you want us to go and, and separate everything now? And the master says, no, wait, because if you separate things now, you might get things mixed up and, and you'll, you'll get some of the wheat in with the weeds. Wait until the end. And so Jesus is promising that even though the kingdom is, and for us, has come and the the fish are being gathered and gathered and gathered, the people are being gathered and gathered and gathered, that the time of separation and judgment hasn't yet happened, but will. It will happen. God will sort everything out, and he will separate the evil from the righteous. Now, that doesn't just mean people that have done really good stuff, and people that have done really bad stuff, as if we're going to be judged merely upon our works, but those that are righteous means those that are in a right covenant relationship with God. Those that God has atoned for their sins and has accepted them into his kingdom. And obviously the only way that can happen for anyone is for the Messiah, is for Jesus to have given his blood for them and for them to be made righteous and for them to accept the terms of the covenant and walk according to the terms of the covenant. And God is going to separate out those who have rebelled, those who have been rebellious, those who have been sinful and wicked from those that are in a right covenant relationship with him. That doesn't mean you're going to be judged by, have you done enough good stuff to be saved? It's going to be based on whether or not you are in a right covenant relationship with God. But I want you to notice something here. This parable is all about gathering up fish of every kind. Do you see that at the end of verse 47? Gathered fish of every kind. The, the struggle that most first century Jews had that became followers of Jesus, the struggle that they had was that the gospel was tantamount to your family. Just imagine your family has a huge inheritance. Imagine, I know that's hard for a lot of us to imagine, but imagine that there's like this huge multi-million dollar estate that your family owns, and it is your family plot of land, and it is your family inheritance, and it's going to belong to your children and your grandchildren. And then imagine one of your cousins starts broadcasting to the whole world, hey, if you want to be part of our family, you can come be part of our family. And you're like, whoa, hold on. Not everybody can be part of our family. And you're like, and your cousin says, no, 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 everybody can be part of our family. And he starts broadcasting to the whole world, you can be part of our family. The gospel is the, the nation of Israel, through Jesus, giving away their family inheritance to the world. That's, that's what the gospel is. The gospel is the good news that through Jesus, anyone and everyone can have the inheritance that God promised to Abraham. And again, that would be incredibly, that would be a huge struggle, wouldn't it? If you're part of that family of Abraham to think not everybody can be part of this family. And then, and then they start to tell people things like, you don't even have to be circumcised. You don't have to eat kosher food. You don't have to keep the Sabbath. You don't have to follow our cultural, ethnic boundaries and laws because that no longer determines whether or not you're righteous, whether or not you're in the covenant family. What determines that is whether or not you're a follower of Jesus. And that's it. And if you're a follower of Jesus and you follow Jesus faithfully, you can be part of our family and you can have the inheritance that is ours. And there were a lot of Jewish followers of Jesus in the first hundred years that really struggled with that concept. And they really struggled with letting these Gentiles, these uncircumcised people into their family. And, and people, humans, have always struggled with nationalism and racism believing that people of their nationality or of their ethnicity or of their cultural group are better in some way, 
my way of being, my way of living, my traditions, my culture is the right way and everybody else is just weird or strange. And in order to be part of my family or my group, you can't do things th that way. People have always struggled with that. Of course, we have layers of historical happenings. People that have made war against another nationality or another, against another ethnic group. People that have enslaved and oppressed people of other nationalities and other ethnic groups. And then those groups trying after the fact to try to find reconciliation and peace. These things have always been a struggle. But look at what Jesus is saying. Look at what the prophets always said. The kingdom of heaven is a gathering up of fish of every kind. The entire point of the gospel is that it is for everyone. It is a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multinational gathering of people. That's what the church is. The church is a multi-ethnic community. It had to be. And so when Jewish Christians would say, whoa, 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 I don't know about this whole Gentile thing, the apostles would get in their face. In fact, we have one incidence where one apostle kind of fell into that trap, where Peter was kind of being a racist, was kind of saying, no, 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 uh, I don't know. When these other, my Jewish cousins are around, my Jewish brothers are around, I'm not going to eat with my Gentile brothers. I'm not going to, you know, share a table with them. And Paul got in his face and said, you are not walking in step with the gospel. I want to say this really clearly. Nothing is more antithetical to the gospel than racism. Nothing is more antithetical. Nothing is more contrary to the gospel of Jesus than racism than behavior or attitudes or words that say my ethnic group, my nationality, people that look like me, speak my language, come from my group are better than people of another group or another nationality or speak another language or come from another whatever. Nothing is more antithetical to the gospel than that because the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God is that it is a gathering up of fish of every kind. When Jesus told the parable about the mustard seed, he said it's going to grow into a tree where birds of the air, and again, the picture is birds of every kind, are coming and making a nest in its branches. The point, the point of the good news is that the Messiah is here to rescue and save and to adopt people of every nation, not just Jew, but also Gentile. Yes, first to the Jew but also to the Gentile, and that's you and I. So, so when I see in my country, when I see people who are purportedly Christian, who claim to be Christian, who claim to follow Jesus, that in times past enslaved and separated from, and to this day um, are biased against, people of other ethnicities, that makes me angry. That makes me sad because nothing is more antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ than racism or culturalism or nationalism that says people from my nation, my group, my ethnicity are better or more deserving. Nothing is more contrary to the gospel than that. The gospel is all about the gathering of fish, in this case, in the parable, people of every kind. Jesus wants a multi-ethnic family. So I believe, I believe that a church family, a church family in any community ought to make up the, the ethnicities of that community. And if we're not, we're not being who we're called to be. We have to make an intentional effort to reach people of every tribe, every language, every tongue. We have to make an effort to reach every kind of person, male and female, slave and free, Jew and Gentile. We have to make an effort to bring all of the fish of every kind into the net that is the kingdom of God. That is our job. That's what evangelism is all about. And if we're only focused on and only reaching out to and only talking to people that look like us and talk like us and think like us and come from our same background and, and group, 
that we're making a monumental mistake. And if we're suspicious of and biased against people that don't look like us in the family of God, then we're making a monumental mistake. Nothing is more antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ than racism. Because the whole point is the gathering up of fish of every kind. And I'm thankful for that because I am not culturally, ethnically a descendant of Abraham that I know of. I'm a Gentile, but Jesus has rescued me into and made me a part of the family of God. He has shouted to me, hey, you you can have this family inheritance. You can be adopted into this family. And he's adopted me into his multi-ethnic family. And I am incredibly thankful for that. And so I want to reach out and be part of the, the dragnet and bringing in people of every kind so that this family can be as diverse as Jesus intends for it to be. Let's say a prayer before we close. Father, we thank you for your generosity and your grace that, that you have not just saved and rescued and forgiven people of Abraham's lineage, but that you have rescued and saved and adopted people of every nation and tribe and tongue. And Father, we are so incredibly thankful to be part of that rescue mission. And Father, help us to participate with you in bringing in people of every kind, people from every nation, people from every tribe, people from every tongue. Help us, Father, to reach out with the good news of Jesus. Help us, Father, not to reinforce the cultural barriers and and stereotypes and, and biases that are so often pushed on people. Help us, Father, to break free of those things. Help us, Father, to love and to be loved and to be part of this world-changing good news that you have brought into the world. Help us, Father, to live as people of the kingdom, to embrace right now the principles and the way of being of your kingdom that you've set forth in Jesus. Father, help us to be followers of Jesus. Help us, Father, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for adopting us, but also thank you for giving us this way of life. Help us, Father, to walk in step with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you all. I appreciate you. If there's anything we can do for you, if you have any prayers, uh, anything we can pray for you about, or if there's anything that you need, please leave that in the comment section. Hope you have a wonderful day. God bless. Bye-bye.